Greetings and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this program. For those of you who are lucky enough to join us early, I hope you enjoyed the wonderful music of the late, great Lakshmi Shankar. My name is Asad Ali Jafri, and I'm the executive director of the South Asia Institute here in Chicago. We're a nonprofit that celebrates the diversity of the South Asian diaspora through the arts. We amplify the voices of artists and creatives and we curate, produce, and present the visual and performing arts, as well as film and literature. Of course, much of that has been online due to the pandemic, and we're really excited to partner today with the Asian American Writers Workshop. To talk to you about tonight's program and act as our host, as well as introduce you to our special featured guest, I wanna introduce you all to the executive director of the Asian American Writers Workshop, Jafreen Adin. Jafreen. Hi, Asad. Thanks so much. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Jafreen, and I am the executive director of the Asian American Writers Workshop. We are a national nonprofit dedicated to the empowerment of Asian and Asian diasporic storytellers. Since our founding in 1991, we've provided an alternative literary art space that works at the intersections of art, migration, and social justice. And we are so excited to co-host and present tonight's uh, reading and conversation with Kavita Das. Um, I'm going to give a quick introduction of Kavita. I want to go over a couple of housekeeping notes, and then we'll get straight into the event. Um, Kavita writes about culture, race, gender, and their intersections. Her work has been published in a number of places, including CNN, Teen Vogue, Catapult, uh, Tin House, Long Reads, The Atlantic, Los Angeles Review of Books, and the list goes on and on. Um, her first book, which we are so excited to be discussing tonight, Poignant Song, was published in 2019. Um, for tonight's event, we're going to have a, com a combination of conversations and readings and, of course, music. How can you have an event dedicated to Lakshmi Shankar without music? Um, two quick housekeeping things. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you have questions, we are going to have some audience Q&A at the end of the event. So feel free to drop your questions throughout um, it, throughout the program. You don't need to wait until the end if something comes up. Again, the Q&A button is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and also, unlike in-person events, the thing about Zoom events is um, you can chat while the speakers are talking. So feel free to utilize the chat function, which is on the right side of your screen. You can click the chat button, which is at the bottom, if you want to bring that up. And we welcome engagement and parallel conversations in the chat alongside our own discussion. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Kavita, who will kick us off with um, a quick reading, and then we'll get right into it. Over to you, Kavita. Hi, everyone. Um, before I jump right into the reading, I just want to say welcome to everyone and uh, some really quick thank yous. I want to thank um, Shireen Ahmad, Asad Ali Jafri, Urud Shakil, and everyone at the South Asian Institute um, for this program and for everything you do to preserve and promote um, South Asian culture and arts. And I, I want to thank Jafreen uh, Udin and Lily Philpon and everyone at the Asian American Writers Workshop, which has been a literary home for me uh, from before I was a writer. Um, I think organizations like AWW helped me see that it was possible. So thank you for all you do for Asian American voices and stories. Um, and of course, thank you to everyone who is spending the daytime, evening, whatever time zone you're in uh, with us today. Um, we're gonna jump right in. I'm gonna start with a, uh, a reading, a brief reading from the book. I'm gonna read from the very first chapter. Um, so, uh, and basically this chapter, uh, the only thing you need to know is that um, it focuses on Lakshmi Shankar lending her voice to the um, Oscar uh, winning film uh, Gandhi, of, which is of course about Mahatma Gandhi. And um, so I'll jump right in. The one piece that's not in this reading is to know that not only did she serve as the singer for the soundtrack, um, which was composed by Ravi Shankar, her brother-in-law. She also, her father was part of Gandhiji's 
Swadeshi movement. So it was a particularly meaningful uh, moment for her. Okay, jumping right in. The screen lights up again with the billowing flames of Gandhi's funeral pyre. And through the spirals of fire and smoke, we get a hazy view of a vast crowd seated on the ground around the pyre. Wafting in the background are the strums of the sitar and sarod. The scene shifts to a sunset sky over the Ganges. At the center is Nehru, played by Roshan Saint, along with some of Gandhi's closest allies aboard a ferry. Nehru is holding Gandhi's ashes in an urn. As he pours Gandhi's ashes into the still waters of the Ganges, illuminated by the sun's last rays, the strains of the sitar are paired with Gandhi's powerful words. When I despair, I remember that all through history, the way of truth and love has always won. There have been tyrants and murderers, and for a time, they can seem invincible. But in the end, they always fall. Think of it, always. The screen fades to black, and Gandhi's words and the accompanying music fade to silence. After a second's pause, the screen lights up one final time with the film's credits. As the first names roll across the screen, Lakshmi's lone voice, unaccompanied by any instruments, begins to sing a Hindu bhajan, beloved by countless Indians, including Gandhi himself. Then, in the final two minutes of the film, we are treated to a string orchestration of this bhajan which suddenly morphs into an Indian folk version with flute, shanai, and tabla, goading it along to a faster and faster trance-inducing tempo. In the midst of its acceleration and building crescendo, the music suddenly slows and the instruments fade to silence. And then, just as it did in the beginning of the film, Lakshmi's clear melodious voice, at once as old as Hindustani music, yet fresh as a stream flowing from the Himalayas, sings one final soulful rendition. The final credits come to a standstill on the screen and then fade to black as they follow her voice into silence. Lakshmi's voice is the moving finale to a prolific film about the most famous Indian of the 20th century and perhaps of all time. Just as it does in this film, her voice has played a part in key cultural moments in the past century, especially given her role as the leading Hindustani female singer in the movement that brought Indian music to the West. But to truly understand her significance in the meandering path that Indian music took across the world, one must follow Lakshmi's own journey, one that started as a dancer, not a singer, one that started in India, but ended in the US, and one that touched every note in the scale of life. Je peed parai jane Vaishnava jane to beginning, I would love to know, you know, what prompted you to tell this story and, and what was it about Lakshmi's life and her story that you felt like this, this was a story that needed to be told? Sure. Um, so on one level, I actually knew Lakshmi Ji my whole life. Um, and the reason I knew her my whole life is largely because so, you know, um, I grew up in New York City. My parents immigrated to the States from India um, in the early 1970s. 
and they got very involved in um, the South Asian music scene and in bringing artists um, from India um, to perform in, in the US. And so we had musicians um, who would come and stay with us, you know, and so I kind of grew up with that, surrounded by that and with a front row seat to that. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Um, but Lakshmiji was um, definitely part of all of this, but something much, much more. She ended up being almost like a remote grandmother to me. Um, and she was just part of our extended family. And part of that was because she was a South Indian woman who had uh, married into a Bengali family. And that mirrored my own family where my mother is South Indian married to uh, my father who's Bengali. And so I think there was that very kind of a connection about that cross-cultural um, um, experience. Um, um, so that was, you know, on the on the personal level, uh, but she was also my introduction really to Hindustani music. And I grew up steeped much more in Carnatic, the South Indian, a South Indian tradition. Um, and so I was much more familiar with that and with Western classical music, I play the violin. Um, so she was really my introduction to Hindustani music. And I just fell in love with her music and her lyricism. Um, and, and as you know, our tastes evolve, you know, as we become teenagers and we become adults and all of that, her music just remained a staple in my life. But it was really when I became an adult that, um, you know, and I started working in the social change sector. I, you know, um, you know, uh, most recently I worked at Race Forward where I was the head of marketing and communications. I was really in doing work that was looking at social justice issues that I realized like there's the issues writ large um, and then there's the quieter way that uh, the stories of people of color, women of color um, get kind of, they either fade into the, you know, into the ether or they are actively erased. Um, and so I started to be haunted by this. And, um, and I was so um, amazed and I was, the, you know, the questions I had around Lakshmiji were, how did she do what she did? You know, she was, um, very uh, similar age to my grandmother. And so I had a, and my grandmother lived a, a much more traditional life. And so I had a great appreciation for all the ways in which Lakshmiji had transcended all kinds of barriers. Um, and so I was very curious about that. And, and secondly, the other kind of key question I had was, given all that she had done, why was she not better known and celebrated uh, in particular in her home country? Um, so these were like questions that were literally keeping me up at night. And, um, and even though I was pretty well settled in my career and felt very consumed by my social justice, racial justice work, I, I kind of, you know, jumped with both feet and both hands to, to tell her story because I felt very um, concerned that that her story would kind of fade and that, you know, people should really know about her, particularly because um, she was the most prominent um, female member of this movement that brought Indian music to the West. And I felt like it was a story that had largely been told from the male perspective. Yeah, I mean, just reading her book, it's so, it's so clear how much of a vanguard she really was and, and just so radical for her time. And so, especially for folks who haven't had the chance to read the book yet, um, can you talk a little bit about why exactly her work was so unique and, and what it was specifically about her artistry that set her apart from her contemporaries? Sure, um, I think that some of the things that, I mean, first and foremost, there is, there's her voice, which hopefully many people just heard and heard at the beginning of the program. And it's just a, a beautiful, you know, gorgeous voice. Um, but, you know, some of the things that really stuck out to me um, are, first and foremost, the way that she grew up, you know, she grew up in this non-traditional way. She, you know, was born in Jamshedpur. She was born into a South Indian family, but she was born in Jamshedpur, spent some time in Chennai. And, you know, first things first, she was um, a South, born into a South Indian Brahmin family when there were debates going on around whether, you know, young girls and particularly young Brahmin girls should be learning uh, dance and particularly Bharatanatyam. And her mom was resolute that she learn it. And she learned and she was one of the first 
few girls from her area who learned and performed. And, uh, and then that led to her going to Almora, to the foothills of Almora, to join Uday Shankar, her would-be um, brother-in-law's um, breakthrough dance troupe that drew on traditions from all over India. He had teachers and performers from all over India. And so she was exposed to that at the age of 13. And then she moved to, you know, Mumbai. And so she, she had all these cross-cultural experiences and you can see that reflected in her, um, in her approach to her music. And then even when she became a singer, she, when she could no longer dance because of a health issue and she became a singer in her early thirties, um, you know, and she had been doing some Bollywood soundtracks, you know, um, and she fell in love with Hindustani music. You know, she, it's, she herself is surprised, you know, uh, by it. And so that really shows you um, how open, you know, she was to an end. Um, and while it took years for her to establish herself, and, and then that opened more doors, you know, to touring as a solo artist within India and then all over the world, you know, and as we'll find out about other cross-cultural experiences, collaborating with artists from all different cultures. So to me, you know, she has an expansive breadth of work that crosses all kinds of genres from, you know, Karnate to, 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 to you know, Hollywood to uh, pop music to, you know, all of these things. And then really interesting fusion work, but rooted in is, is because she herself, you know, there's other artists who, who have a very different experience where they grew up in one area, they were taught in one garana, and they kind of hold up that tradition. And they're very, you know, um, you know, they're very focused on that. And she, I think, is on a far farther end of the spectrum where she, you know, was, uh, had more diverse experiences, and it kind of shows in her, you know, in her body of work. Um, so I think those are like two kind of things that really, you know, set her apart. Yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, no, I think uh, it's so interesting how, you know, when you think of classical music, you think of it being in one particular bucket. And she was so ahead of her time in that way, because you couldn't really put her in a bucket. She, you know, she was so versatile and, and did so many different types of, you know, musical forms, art forms, um, which is, like I said, just so radical for that time. So um, I would love to hear some more from the book. Um, sure. I'll turn it over to you for the second reading. I think I'll, I'll read a little bit more that gives us some more insight into her as, uh, as a musician and artist. Okay. As a spiritual person, Lakshmi was able to tap into this deep and profound sentiment of divine love and translate it into her music. Some of Mira's bhajans and Surdasan's bhajans appeal to me very much because I suppose they wrote what they felt, Lakshmi added, even to Kabir's bhajans, some of them are so philosophical. When you understand the meaning, you want to pour your heart out. Lakshmi confessed that she was touched when an audience member compared her to Mirabai. Sometimes I've heard people say, you're Sakshat Mira, Mira incarnate. And upon hearing this, I would be elated. In addition to her distinct style of singing, there was her unique approach to performance. The performative aspect of Hindustani music is as important as the music itself. And the interaction between artist and audience lies at the core of the performance. Hindustani music performances are so emotionally charged that first time attendees are often surprised by their interactive nature. The call and response is not limited to interactions between the singer and their accompanying musicians and percussionists. There is usually a parallel call and response between the singer and the audience, with audience members exclaiming sabash, bravo, or beish, excellent, to express their exaltation or to acknowledge an excellent display of technique melodic dexterity, emotional poignancy, or ideally all three elements. As a dramatic dancer, Lakshmi knew how to physically evoke the rasa and bhava, or the emotion and mood that are at the heart of each musical piece. And this, coupled with her heartfelt approach to singing, made her an expressive and soulful vocalist. Also, her eclectic and non-traditional childhood and youth, traveling from Madras to Almora, becoming a child dancer and joining a professional dance troupe, marrying into a Bengali family, and of course, pursuing Hindustani music, helped her appreciate a range of regional cultural traditions and cull from them. Furthermore, her work as a playback singer taught her to sing in several languages. 
So as Lakshmi evolved her own style of singing through her early performances across North India, she also developed a performance style that was accessible to her diverse audiences. She adjusted her repertoire to the locality, singing compositions, especially bhajans, in the regional dialect which endeared her to audiences. Any language, any music, if you sing it well, it will please people. Apart from Lakshmi's unique approach to Hindustani music and the talent and experience she brought to singing, there was her exquisitely beautiful voice. A singer's voice is her most prized possession, her most indelible identifying trait. From the range of notes she can cover to the actual timbre of her voice, from the way her voice sounds at its quietest moments to its booming ones, these are all characteristics that distinguish a singer in the minds of her audience. And Lakshmi's voice was exceptional. When a Hindustani singer begins to sing a raga, she often starts out quietly, slowly, and typically in the lower registers of her vocal range. She's just beginning the process of weaving together the composition, laying the foundation. And like an intricately woven sari, she begins to wrap and fold the raga and it takes form in the ears and hearts of her listeners. The notes she sings are like thick, long brush strokes, but in her evolving rendering of the raga, her voice grows brighter and more resonant as she climbs into her higher register. With her powerful, resonant voice combined with her gift for finding melody and an effortless agility for executing intricate runs spanning multiple octaves, Lakshmi displayed the characteristics of a sublime Hindustani singer. Lakshmi's success as a Hindustani singer did not arrive overnight or in a straightforward path. It came slowly and with great dedication and discipline. The one thing that I personally really loved about the book and I think is especially embodied by that excerpt you just read is you, you inform us as much about classical Indian music, the genre, as you do about Lakshmi Shankar's life. I, as somebody who really didn't have that much familiarity with with classical Indian music. I learned so much about kind of the technicalities of that, the entire kind of genre and industry. So I'm curious, just from a kind of craft, you know, writer perspective, how did you strike that balance of telling her story and, you know, teaching, informing, educating people about this genre and worlds that you know, they might not be as familiar with? That's a great question. And that was a question that I actually sat with at the very beginning. And, and, it, and the question beneath that question is, who is this book for? Who is the audience of this book? And so I saw this book and I thought that I want my friends to read this book. I want my husband to read this book. I, um, I grew up steeped in Carnatic music, but I had to learn about Hindustani music in order to write this book. I had been an audience member. I had been a passive you know, recipient of it. I didn't know a lot about its history. I didn't know, you know all the cultural context of it. Um, and so I had to learn that as part of research and all of that. But what I really didn't want to do, you know, um, when I thought about what I don't want to do, which is write something that is kind of insider baseball, that is just for the people who are already fans of Hindustani music, who are already familiar with its history, and who already know, you know, Lakshmi Shankar. Um, and part of that was also deciding that I saw her as a global person, someone who had one foot in India and one foot, you know, in the US, you know, really one foot all over the world. Um, and so I really wanted this book to be an international book. Um, and that meant that someone, anybody could pick it up, um, you know, from a baby boomer who was kind of familiar with that moment in time, you know, where Indian music made its way to the West, um, but didn't know too much about the personalities and, uh, and maybe particularly her, um, and, and be able to read it. Um, and then I also wanted anybody from future generations to be able to pick it up and, and read it. And so I, I wanted it to read um, with a very current feel uh, because I think the things that she did, they are still, um, they are still very, very relevant today. Uh, the truth is uh, towards the end of the book, I have interviews with um, her granddaughter, Ginger Shankar and uh, Anushka Shankar, her, her niece, uh, Ravi Ji's daughter. Uh, about being 
um, you know, about her legacy to them and what they face currently today as South Asian, um, you know, artists, and they're facing a lot of similar challenges. So, you know, that's, that's kind of uh, what I really um, sought to do. So um, I sometimes saw my role as a translator. So I would read these very um, theoretical books about the theory of Hindustani music, the history, of, and, and try to put it into more accessible um, terms. And hopefully I did that. No, you totally did. And I, you know, I, like I said, I learned as much about the musical genre as I did about her life, which I, I personally loved. Um, on, on kind of the other side, you know, moving from the audience, so much of what we do at the workshop every day is subverting the notion of, of whose story gets told. And a big part of that work is, um, you know, really understanding the systemic gatekeepers that may or may not be in place. Um, and when I think about, you know, Lakshmiji's legacy and, you know, what you mentioned earlier about why she didn't reach more widespread fame, um, I wonder if there was a similar kind of form of gatekeeping that impacted her ability to do that. And so um, I'm curious if you could go into, you know, what kind of barriers, either subtle or obvious, societal or industry-wide, you know, what, what was kind of in the way um, systemically that might have prevented her from, from gaining more of that widespread fame? Sure, yeah, this was, this was, like I said, one of the preoccupying questions I had, you know, and it only got deeper and deeper because as I saw how much she managed to do, it, you know, it kind of begged this question. Um, and I think, you know, uh, right at the beginning, you know, as we were talking about uh, India is, you know, is ripe with so many subcultures with, and it's very, you know, has, it's so diverse. But the other side of that coin is that there's a lot of entrenchment. You know, there's issues of caste, there's issues of regionalism, um, there's issues of many, many languages and dialects, you know, and all of these things both make it so rich, but also kind of compartmentalize. Um, and there are a lot of institutions and, you know, um, that are vested in keeping things compartmentalized, you know, um, and so whether it's, it, you know, uh, traditions of music, traditions of dance, traditions of, you know, language, whatever it is, you know, there's this sometimes these purity kind of, you know, tests that, um, you know, under the notion of preserving, you know, traditions. And so um, I think, you know, she, she, did, she didn't come through a traditional Garana system. She learned from a specific teacher uh, who was from the Patiala Karana and uh, Abdul Rahman Khan. She literally heard him once and fell in love with his voice and, you know, um, started learning from him from, for, uh, you know, several years. And then at one point, she switched to another teacher who, who, who wasn't really even in the Karana system. He was trying to kind of um, be more, you know, equalizing. And they had two different philosophies of singing. And so that's, an, you know, even in response to your previous question, so she wasn't even steeped in that kind of singular way. So she had different ways of approaching, you know, the music, but but that is also a form of, you know, it's both a form of tradition, but it's also a, a gatekeeping notion. Um, and uh, and then on top of that, she was a South Indian woman pursuing a North Indian tradition, um, and there weren't a lot of even women who were. Um, out there singing, um, you know, as solo artists. So there's that as well. I mean, it was very male dominated. Uh, and that is actually very, very key um, that, you know, when you think of the industry, when we say this, there's the artists, there's critics, you know, um, all of it, it was male dominated. So um, that is a major, major um, factor in, um, to your point, uh, who gets to sing, who get, you know, who gets the audiences, who gets booked, who gets written about, um, you know, and all of that. And she definitely had uh, Raviji in her corner and he used to collaborate with her, uh, but he was also kind of, you know, focused on on his career and he, he, he did so much. And oftentimes they would collaborate, but, um, but, you know, ultimately she had to, you know, make her, you know, own way. Um, and one of the other things that I really, 
um, kind of determine based on my own observation. And, you know, after kind of working on the book for a while, while I was looking at all these external factors, I had to acknowledge that, you know, one of the things that people most loved about Lakshmi Ji as a person, you know, and, and you know, the way she would approach the stage and her warmth with, you know, the audience and her rapport and her very, her authentic, uh, her authenticity, she, um, you know, she would arrive, she would sing, she would sing what she loved, she would sing what the audience loved, and she was not a very political, you know, person, you know, and she was not uh, a person who self-promoted. And, and so to a certain extent, that is also, you know, um, a barrier or a, a gate. Um, and so I think that, though, you know, that was something I had to acknowledge that um, not as a fault, I mean, it was actually, you know, it's part of who she, she was, but it's also built into probably being a woman and being a woman of a specific era. And um, yeah, so I think those were, those were all um, things that kind of, I think, contributed. But having said that, um, despite all these things, she had um, fans all over the world, you know, and in England and in France. And she herself, you know, she recorded albums in France. And, you know, she would tell me that she was surprised and she would ask French audiences who would wait to talk to her after her concert and ask her questions, you know, and she would ask them, but you don't understand this music. You don't know the words. What are you getting from? And they're like, we understand the feeling behind it. And so that really let her know that there was a global audience for her music. Uh, and that that understood the the kind of the soul, you know, of her music. Yeah, I want to stick to this idea of kind of her global audiences and move to, you know, her tour and collaboration with George Harrison, um, which was incredible to read about. And when I think about, you know, that type of, of cross cultural connection, one thing that kind of sticks out to me is her story in so many ways is it's an immigrant one. You know, it's, um, there's this really almost very American element to her story and her approach. And so I'd love if you could talk a little bit about, you know, this notion of, you know, what does it even mean to be American? Is her story an American one? And how thinking about that may have impacted your writing and, and your own approach in telling her story? No, that's a great question. And that's, you know, when I was talking about what I was thinking about, who's the audience and, you know, the story, um, I, I will confess that I saw this as an American story, as an Indian American story. Um, she lived the last several decades of her life in the U.S. She's a Grammy nominated artist. The Grammys are an uh, American, you know, um, award um, given to artists from all over the world, you know, but um, and so I, I saw this as, um, you know, and I did my research and saw that baby boomers, I mean, they just got overtaken by millennials, you know, a couple of years ago as the largest demographic. I saw this as a pivotal cross-cultural moment that happened, uh, particularly in this country and, you know, in the West. And so I initially had, um, you know, I was like, I'm an American, I'm, you know, working here. So I wanted this to be published in the U.S. Um, and I just kept getting told essentially that it's a niche story and that there isn't a readership for it. And I, I absolutely don't believe that. I believe this is one of the ways that publishers, you know, really undermine, um, you know, the, particularly the larger houses. And I just, I don't uh, believe that, you know, as I said, um, I have a background in marketing communication. So, you know, I, I know that there's, you know, an audience for it. And I knew that I was planning to write it in an accessible way. So, um, so I think that, you know, um, you and I have spoken about this before, you know, as you stepped into your role at Asian American Writers Workshop, but the wheels are turning very slowly, but they're turning. And I think that um, those kind of old, uh, narrow ideas of what is American, what is an American story. And in this case, I mean, I think, if you're jamming on the stage with uh, George Harrison, I, I even question, is that, you know, isn't that American music, you know? Um, and so I think that's, um, that was my ethos, you know, when I was kind of uh, working on this book. Having said that, you know, uh, a couple of friends and a, my mentor kind of said, 
you know what, um, you know, as the doors were closing in my face um, and, you know, and she passed away uh, a year into me working on this project. Mm -hmm. I had only had the opportunity to interview her, you know, probably less than a handful of times. And I was like personally devastated, but then I also knew that I had kind of made this commitment and I wanted to carry forth. Um, and they suggested I um, try to publish in India because it has such a huge English reading um, audience and that so many things would be already understood by them. Um, and so that's, I kind of pursued that route and it was, you know, a night and day kind of experience. Um, and I had a wonderful um, acquiring editor at, you know, HarperCollins, but uh, HarperCollins India. And so, but I think that the reason I tell the story is because it's like the story behind the story, you know, and, um, and it mirrors some of the similar barriers that, um, you know, she faced in her life. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of a little bit, you know, of, you know, behind the scenes, but I, but even with writing it for, um, for an Indian publisher, mm -hmm. I, my husband is from India, he was born and raised, and, you know, he is not necessarily steeped in these musical traditions. So I didn't assume, I didn't want to go into it assuming that people, you know, uh, the readers, whoever they are, had any knowledge. And so that's why I really kind of stuck to my guns of writing it. Um, I mean, I think in one of the chapters, chapter four, I literally stopped the story to give a little history lesson on on Carnatic music and Hindustani music, because uh, I figured if we're going to be using these terms and talking about it, I, I think it's so much more of a richer story. And to me, I see Lakshmiji as part of that story. So, um, so yeah. So that's yeah, that that's was. Fair. Fair. That parallel of of her life and how it fit into the evolution of Hindustani music was was one of my favorite kind of recurring themes in the book. I thought it was so well done um, and just like I said, so informative. Um, so we, I'd love to have one more reading and maybe a little bit more music, um, and then we're gonna kick off the audience Q and A. So everybody, if you haven't already, the Q and A button is at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Feel free to drop in any questions. Um, let's turn it over to Kavita for one more reading, a little bit more music, and then we will kick off the audience Q and A. Over to you, Kavita. Sure. Okay. So I'm just gonna set up this last reading. So as we were talking about uh, in 1974, Lakshmiji, Raviji, um, and uh, joined George Harrison for this collaborative tour uh, in 1974 uh, in support of his Dark uh, Horse album. And it had a Western ensemble, including amazing musicians, including Billy Preston. And it had an Indian ensemble including many amazing musicians, many that you're familiar with, um, you know, Shiv Kumar Sharma, Alaraka, you know, so many. And uh, Lakshmiji was the uh, main singer and um, they actually collaborated uh, on a Hindustani pop song. And this is a, one of the boons of this project was I thought I knew Lakshmiji, you know, pretty well, her, you know, body of work. I had seen her perform so many times. And when I went to talk to her, she suddenly mentioned this and I had known nothing about it. She's like, oh yeah, I sang the Tindustani pop song. It's like, what, with George Harrison? And, and then she played it for me and I, I just couldn't believe it. And what was particularly striking is that it was the year that I was born. So I just kept thinking that, wow, you know, 46 years ago, this was happening. And I don't think we've seen something as, um, um, such a big cross-cultural production uh, that spans rock and roll all the way to traditional Indian music and fusion. So with that, I'm gonna jump in. The deafening roar of thousands of music fans echoes through Vancouver's Pacific Coliseum, overwhelming Lakshmi's ears as she stands on the stage, poised at the mic with only the curtain between her and them. In close to 20 years of performing, nothing has prepared her for this not even regularly performing alongside her superstar brother-in-law, Ravi Shankar. The grandest music halls can't compare to this vast stadium arena, and the liveliest Hindustani music fans can't compete with these boisterous rock fans. While adjusting the palu of her sari and arranging her hair, 
She laughs at the notion of herself as a rock star, a 48 year old rock star clad in a sari and bindi. The only exception she's made to her usual attire is to wear her hair loose, her raven tresses flowing down both sides of her face, grazing her back. She knows that the real rock star, one of the biggest the world has seen, will soon be at her side. But he is so much more, and she is one of the few people who has caught a glimpse of the real persona of former Beatle George Harrison. In him, she has found a soul she recognizes, an Indian soul. Otherwise, why else would she be here on stage at a rock concert? Why would any of them be here? On the other side of the curtain, the fans are going wild in anticipation of what lies ahead. It's the 2nd of November, 1974, and this is the kickoff concert for the eagerly anticipated tour in support of Dark Horse. George Harrison's third solo studio album and the follow-up to his popular and critically acclaimed Living in the Material World. This is also his first tour since the devastating breakup of the Beatles in 1970, and also the first tour of any member of the band since it stopped touring together in 1966. Instead of creating a tour designed to showcase the hits of the Beatles or even his own hits as a solo artist, George Harrison defied the expectations of critics and fans alike by creating something that has never been seen before, an intercultural hybrid tour with his great friend and collaborator, sitar maestro Ravi Shankar, featuring Indian music and rock and roll inventively fused. Lakshmi watches as Ravi takes his place in front of the audience, getting into his conductor stance. She looks over and sees beautiful 22-year-old Vijay also standing ready at the mic across the stage. Behind her stands 30-year-old Kumar, tambourine in hand. The past several months of recording and rehearsing with George and his rock band in the lead up to this tour seem to be a blur. Now, she and George will sing a Hindustani pop song for thousands of screaming rock fans. Lakshmi wonders what they will think of this new fangled genre of music, one that Ravi and George dreamt up and one to which she's giving voice. The curtains open, the stage lights flash, and the cheers of excited fans reach fever pitch as George walks out on stage. She sees Ravi raise both his arms and hears the keyboardist play the opening chords. Then, somehow, above the din, she hears her own voice and George's come together soulfully, harmoniously, to sing this Hindustani pop song about their beloved Lord Krishna. Lakshmi brings out the sentiment behind the melody, but instead of being accompanied by tabla flute or harmonium, she's buoyed by keyboard, saxophone, guitar, and drums. As the song comes to a close, the crowd bursts into thunderous applause and appreciative cheers. After many bows and waves, the curtains close on the Dark Horses Tour's inaugural concert. Now, they will get on their private plane, emblazon with an own symbol, and repeat this performance close to 50 more times in nearly as many cities over the next two months. It's such a that visual at the end of your reading of the giant plane and the ohm symbol, um, something very kind of 
70s about it. Um, so we're gonna move over to audience Q&A. Um, I'm going, again, if people have questions, feel free to add them in the Q&A button at the bottom. I'm gonna kick it off by actually combining two questions. Um, what age did she start dancing and then begin singing and performing? And then following up from that, um, how did her dance training influence her performance style as a singer? Um, great question. She uh, was around uh, 10 years old when she started uh, dancing. Um, Bharatanatyam, you know, she learned from a Bharatanatyam teacher named Kandapan Pillai. And actually, they both were recruited. Uday Shankar came to tour in uh, Madras, and um, and he auditioned both Lakshmi Shankar as well as her teacher. And so Kandapan Pillai also went up to Almora to be the Bharatanatyam teacher to the troupe, because he had teachers from different you know disciplines. Um, and and then as I mentioned, she danced you know in that troupe. She learned you know Uday Shankar's kind of trademark style, which was called from different um, genres uh, of dance. And um, so all of this is, you know, something that she had. And I think the question was, how did it show through in her singing? Yeah, I asked her about this. And I definitely saw it, you know, um, you know, as I thought about it more, she was a very expressive singer. And, um, you know, expressive, you know, through her eyes, through the way she um, approached um, the lyricism of the way she sang and um, gestures, um, you know, Hindustani music is, uh, it's, it's not, um, it's very expressive. And so to the extent that a singer can, uh, and you're taking the audience on a journey, as I kind of described, it's like this unspooling. And so, you know, when it's slow and quiet, when it's meditative, when it becomes frenetic, you know, um, she could do that full range. And um, it was reflected in the way that she bore herself on stage. And I definitely think, and I asked her and she, I said, do you think your dance training in, impacts the way that you sing? And she's like, absolutely. So I, and I could see it you know, after I thought about it a bit. Um, so going back a little bit to, to, your, to your process as a writer and, and your craft, um, how did you do the research for the book? Um, I know you mentioned you personally knew her, but beyond that, you know, first person interviews, did you talk to any other family members? Could you go into, you know, your process in doing the research? Sure. Um, I, I did first person interviews. Um, and as I said, I, I did a, uh, uh, some of them and then I had planned to build on them. And so the, you know, the interviews were first to get uh, a contour of, of her life. And it, you know, and as I said, you know, I thought I had a, a good sense, but then there were always these amazing surprises, you know, that I didn't know about. And so that's why it was really important for me to um, to get that contour and have her, you know, talk, walk me through it. Um, and there's so many more things I would have loved to, you know, uh, talk to her about. Um, but, you know, I had, you know, that served as my kind of initial, you know, material. And then there was a lot of, you know, research into Hindustani music, research into um, that uh, moment in time, you know, of Indian music making its way to the West. Um, and then, there was talking to different people, uh, interviewing her son, uh, Kumar Shankar, who um, went on that tour with her um, and who uh, just, uh, and it, uh, her daughter, unfortunately, Vijay Shankar, who was also a beautiful singer, passed away. Um, so I, I couldn't interview her. Her daughter, Jinja Shankar, I did interview, who's a violinist and singer herself and composer of film scores. Anushka Shankar, I um, spoke with. Um, and Ravi Ji is somebody who I really would have loved to talk to because they had such an, they were uh, collaborators, friends, um, you know, and brother and sister in law. And so, you know, um, apparently he used to call her up, you know, when his memory would fade on something because she was so uh, acute. And that is actually something I heard from her and Ravi Ji. And that's what made me feel. Uh, very confident in the things that she she told me. I I would independently verify 
and she was always correct. She, you know, she had given me a timeline in the very beginning and everything, you know, mapped out. And so she, um, you know, she just had a very, um, very strong memory of, uh, of events. Yeah, so those were like some of the key, um, and then of course, you know, other, uh, other books that I read that kind of um, spoke to this history and these moments in time. Um, you know, you mentioned kind of being surprised hearing about her collaboration with George Harrison. Um, was there anything else as you read the, as you did your research that you discovered um, that surprised you as you were writing? Yeah, there was, I mean, I think, um, I think there were, you know, two things. One is another, you know, another, there was an, an now, I thought I knew all my favorite songs by her, you know, my favorite budgets, my favorite, you know, and I, they've, they've gone with me from college to house to house to house, you know, all of that. But then again, you know, uh, in the course of research and talking to her, she had this collaboration with a Greek musician named Nordar and she sang this lullaby, you know, if we had had more time, I would have cued that up as well. And it's so beautiful. It's, it's so beautiful. And it's like, become this favorite lullaby that I play for my own, you know, one-year-old daughter. Um, and, you know, I, I did a collaboration with other musicians and I included it, you know, um, because I thought it was just such a, a, a beautiful piece. And, you know, to know somebody for, you know, a couple of decades and to, to literally discover a piece of music uh, by them, that's a gift, you know, and it also was a nice uh, reminder to me as I would get kind of into the into the holes of, you know, uh, of, of writing and, and researching to just kind of take a moment and enjoy um, and to see, it, it just reconfirmed for me her expansive body of work. Um, so I think those were, that, that was probably, you know, one of the discoveries I made that was a reminder to me. And I think that, that, that the other thing I mentioned was, you know, I was very much focused on external factors for why maybe she was not as well known. And so, when I finally had to kind of acknowledge that, you know, um, that her own way of being in the world, which was actually very beautiful and warm, might have also contributed to um, her lack of recognition just because she wasn't someone who was constantly seeking out the spotlight, mm -hmm. um, you know, was part of it. And that's a kind of a quieter um, form um, of a quieter barrier. Yeah. Um, I always think of women in our mothers and grandmothers generation having so many secrets that we know nothing about. They, you know, we, they, we underestimate them, I think, way too often. And she's such proof of that. Um, there's a question um, if you could talk about Dancing in the Light. Sure, that was her final album. And that was the album that she, that, uh, she received a Grammy nomination. Um, I think in 2008 for best traditional world music album. And, um, you know, it, I know that she was, you know, really overjoyed for the Grammy nomination, but it really came, you know, when she was in her eighties, you know, so it was very uh, late in life, but I think it meant so much to her that her adopted country, you know, where she had, I mean, she had moved here uh, in part because she was performing here so much and, and she was performing here and in Europe. And so, you know, the, the travel back and forth and also her son and daughter had, you know, settled down here. And so, um, you know, she wanted to be here. Um, but I think it meant so much to her, you know. Um, so yeah, that, um, it, there are some songs on it that she had, you know, that were staples and there were some, you know, newer things, but um, that, you know, she didn't ultimately get the Grammy for it, for it um, but it, sh the nomination itself meant a lot to her. Mm. I loved um, the scene in the book when you described her showing you the Grammy nomination and in her home. And it was this beautiful kind of deeply personal moment that that I loved getting a glimpse of as, you know, even in the narrative, it was one of my favorite parts. It's really showing, you know, like she had this deep, you know, um, joy, like I could say, you know, she wanted, you know, uh, a Grammy nomination and it was the first time I was meeting her since she got it. And, and, you know, when she said, oh, do you want to see it? You know, and it was literally, 
like the way, um, and I mean this, and like, you know, she was so excited, you know, and I was so excited to see it and to see it, you know, on her, on her wall and to talk to her about it. Um, and so it was, you know, and of course that was also the, in that same moment is when I took the plunge and said, I want to write about you. <laughs> and so, and, and she, you know, and she said, yes. And I was so happy. Um, and then of course I had to figure out how to do it. Right. <laughs> um, one last question that I think is um, a quick one. Is she related to Ananda Shankar and did she perform with him? I don't know if she performed with Ananda Shankar. Ananda Shankar is, um, I hope I don't get my family tree wrong here, but I believe Ananda Shankar is the nephew of Ravi Ji. Um, so yes, part of this Shankar family. But to my knowledge, I don't believe that they performed, you know, together. But I do love some of his music. Um, well, thank you, Kavita, so much for your words, your um, your enthusiasm. You just, I think one of the things that, that really makes this book shine is that it's so clear how much you enjoyed writing it and how much you enjoyed telling her story that needed to be told. And so, Everybody, um, the book is called Poignant Song. It is available on Amazon, am I correct? Yep. Have you got it? It's available it's on Amazon. Amazon India. Both. Um, Amazon and Amazon India. Purchase it, read it. It's wonderful. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, thank you to the South Asia Institute for hosting us tonight. Um, and stay tuned. You can visit saichicago.org or aaww.org for information about SAI and the Asian American Writers Workshop. My name is Jeffreen. It's been a true pleasure. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you so much.